Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to BC212. And uh, let's take a moment to pray uh, and uh, get our class started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time to come together again and uh, spend time learning, equipping ourselves. We welcome the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we welcome, Lord, wisdom and understanding from the Holy Spirit. Uh, we pray, God, that we will have clarity in our understanding and clarity, Lord, in, in communicating truth to people so that people may encounter Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, I'm sorry we missed class last week. I'll have to try and catch up. Uh, with a uh, lot of things, but um, we were in lesson number 10, um, page 60. We had started that uh, two weeks back, so I'll just quickly review and uh, continue on from where we paused. Let me just go ahead and share this. Um, So, we were talking about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Uh, we gave some background that uh, Jesus was an historical figure. There is no question about that, uh, both in uh, um, secular history, in Christian writings, as well as in uh, archaeological um, evidence. So, then we asked about the question why is Jesus Christ? unique. Right? Why are we saying that there is no one else like him? You know, why are we saying there's no one else like Jesus? You know, and uh, we're looking at uh, these nine reasons. Uh, we began first of all by looking at Christ's, number one, Christ's claim for himself. You know? What did Jesus claim for himself? Um, he, his claims are very clear, and his claims are very unique. Nobody else claimed what he claims. Right? Jesus said, I am, you know, uh, and to the point where he said, there is no other way. No one can come to the Father except through me, through Jesus. He didn't say, I'll tell you how to live a good life. I'll tell you how to do good things. I will show you what you can do. You go try it. You know, he said, I am the way. You have to come to me. And so that claim is very unique. You don't find anyone else making such claim. Okay? So we looked at some of the scriptures. He claimed pre-existence. You know, it's like somebody coming, if somebody comes today and says, hey, I was here 2,000 years ago, <laughs> we'll send him to the, uh, you know, we'll think he's really gone. <laughs> but Jesus stood up and he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he's using God's title. And of course, we have to remember, keep in mind the audience. And he says, I am. To the Jews, that is God's title. So he's not only saying, I was there, you know, 2,000 years ago, but he's using God's title for himself. Right? So these are claims that nobody has done. You know, he claimed to be one with the Father, he claimed power over death. And then after his resurrection, he says, I was the one who died, I'm alive, and I'm alive forevermore. So when you look at all these claims, uh, nobody else has made such claims. Number two, what does the Bible say about Jesus? Right. So, uh, so just let me make a statement. So, about the first point, you need to we need to uh, learn that very well because um, there are some cults and there are some groups 
examples, a horse witness, who will argue that Jesus never said he was God. They'll say, hey, Jesus, Jesus did it. You're, you're only saying he's God. Jesus himself never said he is God. They say, no, 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 no. I'll show you where Jesus said he is God. You know, so you take them to John 8. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. That is saying he's God. Then John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. See, he's one with the Father. And the Jews, when they heard that, they were ready to kill him. Why? Because in that statement, they understood he's making himself equal with God. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, to their mind, he's making himself equal with God. That's why they wanted to kill him. Then in John 17, he's praying. He says, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So you can at least three references in the Gospel of John itself. That you can say, look at this. Jesus himself said he is God. So that you must be must very clear. Because some groups will tell question us. Where did Jesus say he's God? You are only saying he's God. Where did he say? Look, he claimed to be God. These are the references. Right? Then second is, of course, the Bible statement. So when the Bible talks about Jesus, the Bible also says Jesus is God. Then they will say, why does the Bible say Jesus is Son of God, Son of Man? Oh, these are Actually, there are many titles. Right? There are many titles for the same person describing certain aspects. You know. Uh, but who is he really? He is God. Right? He's really he's God. As son of God, he walked on the earth. As son of man, he, you know, there's another title talking about an aspect of his life. But who is he? He is God. And look at you know some passages. Um where the Bible is making the statement about the deity of Christ. This is on page 64, number 2, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very clear. No, no doubts about that. The Word was God. Bible itself is saying that Jesus is God. Right? And many other, you know, uh, Philippians 2, 5-7. Verse 6 says, he was in the form of God. He had God's form. Right? So, before his incarnation, he was in, in God form. Okay? But then, this one who was in God form had to make himself like a man. And so, what did he do? He emptied himself of the glory of deity, which because that cannot be contained in a physical human body. Too much for this body. So he, he was in God form, but he emptied himself and he became a man. Only what can be contained in a physical human body, flesh and blood body. He had to come in a flesh and blood body because he had to die on the cross. Right? So only what could be contained in a flesh and blood body, he put inside and came. But in God form, he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent. That cannot be put into a body like this, flesh and blood. So he emptied himself, came as a man. But who was he actually? He was the one who was God in God form. He was in the form of God. right? And then there are many other scriptures. Right? First Timothy 3, Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. Who came in the flesh? God. He came in the flesh. Uh, Romans 9.5, again, Paul uh, attests to Jesus being God. Uh, Isaiah 9.6, he's called the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Micah 5.2 uh, tells us that this one who had, uh, from, who was from everlasting. Okay, that means he was eternal and he came. He was the one who came out of Bethlehem. Right? So we can point to all these scriptures. So this is what the Bible says about the deity of Christ. Um, number three, 
the Bible statement about Christ's absolute uniqueness. So once uh, I was, uh, I was, I mean, this this interview you may have seen also online. Uh, it is a little sad because um, this was a very famous pastor. He was being interviewed in the U.S. in the U.S. Uh, some years ago. He was being interviewed on a TV show, and the TV ho host asked him direct question. So, according, you know, you I, I forget the exact how he put the question, but the question was something like this. So, do you preach and teach that only if you believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven? And those who don't believe in Jesus will not go to heaven. Direct question. Very sad, this pastor. I mean, very famous. He said, I don't know. I was feeling so sad. You know, because the Bible is not saying, I don't know. The Bible is very clear. Right? There is no salvation in anyone else. So I was hoping that pastor would say that. And this is, this is on, a, you know, uh, it's a television show seen all over the U.S. and all over the world because nowadays everything is online, and so you can actually go and see that video today. And very sad, very sad. So he came under a lot of criticism for that because he's asked a direct question. You are saying that to go to heaven you have to believe in. His answer should be yes. That is what the Bible says. And give some scripture, <laughs> Acts 4.12. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 2.6, there is no salvation in uh, Acts, there's no salvation in anyone else. There's only one media. No, he should have said that. But he's saying, oh, I don't know. You know, like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. That was his answer. Like, basically, because the, the, the host will then say, oh, so that means Muslims will not go to hell. So she should say, yeah, you know. Or we could put it in a positive way. Every Muslim who believes in Jesus Christ as his Savior will go to heaven. <laughs> you can put it and turn it around and say that. It becomes a gospel invitation, you know. But I was feeling very sad. Uh, but anyway, you know, uh, uh, he's answerable to God for that. But the point is this, point number three, right? The Bible is very clear. No, Bible is not mixing words. Bible is not saying Jesus is one of the ways to salvation or Jesus is one of the gods. Or, the Bible doesn't say like that. Bible very clear. Christ is unique. There is salvation only in Jesus. So if you and I are asked the question, is Jesus unique? Is there salvation only in Jesus? Our answer is yes. Because it's clearly stated in the Bible. Right? Now, if somebody else wants to accept it or not, that is their choice. But if you ask us, we are saying what the Bible says. Bible is very clear. Hmm? So the Bible in you know, there are these, you know, Acts 4 12, there is no salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be. First Timothy 2, 5 and 6. There's one God, one mediator. Not many. One mediator. Not even the apostles are mediators. Only Jesus. Right? One mediator. Between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Not even St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Thomas. No. It's Jesus Christ. Right? So. The Bible presents Jesus as unique. Okay? So number, so that these are the reasons why we are saying Jesus Christ is unique. If you believe the Bible, Jesus is unique. Okay? Number four, why do we say Jesus is unique? Because of the incarnation and virgin. No other human being has this. No other human being is God who became man. 
mostly they are man who tried to become god like they say i i received some enlightenment i received some enlightening oh they say oh, he was man who became god but in jesus is god who became and he was born of a virgin that means he was supernaturally born now why is this so important this is unique absolutely unique but why is this so important so we need to understand that um adam sinned so every person born of adam was born under Adam's sin as a human being and as a human being every every human person was born subject to sin Satan and death that means every person was born from Adam was born under sin Satan death every person man or woman every person after Adam born as sinners satan is is their lord and they will die now therefore no other human being could set us free they could be good people they could have lived good lives they could have said and done good things but they are still born under sin satan death so they can't save us because they have to first save themselves. They can't be our savior. So the only way we could be brought out of our subjection to sin, Satan, and death is there had to come on a man like Adam. But he must not be subject to sin, Satan, and death. And the only way that could happen is if God Himself became a man. And that is Jesus Christ. God became a man. He was fully man, but He was a different man. This man was not subject to sin satan and death because he was god who became man he was not born of adam eve carried him but he was not born of adam he was born by the power of the holy and this was god who became man so this man jesus christ was without sin he was not subject to Satan and he was not subject to death. He conquered death. So that is why he could take the punishment of the rest of us. He had no, pun no sin of his own. So he could come and say, I will take all their sin. All this I will take. Put that punishment on me. Because he had no punishment and no sin of his own. But no other human being was qualified to do that. Because every other human being, male or female, was born under sin, Satan, and death. So Jesus came, God who became man without sin. So he took on our punishment, became our substitute. So what Adam put us under, Jesus is able to bring us out. He died, but it rose up again. And if we have faith in Jesus, then he gives us his life. That means we are born of God. And now we become part of his race. As in Adam, everyone die, but in Christ, Every is whoever believes in him is made alive.
they receive his life. So we now have his life, which puts us above sin, Satan, and death. Very clear. So he's the only one who can give that to us. Because he's the only one who was born without sin, not under Satan, not under death. Also, think about this. So, other religions, mainly say Hinduism, will say, but we had 10 avatars, 10 times God came. 10 avatars. More than that, I don't know how many, 11. No count. So, they say so many times avatars. Then we have to ask, why? Bible says, he came once, finished the work, work is done. Because that means he's really God. God doesn't fail. I need three attempts to pass. <laughs> One time he came, finished the work, went. And he did it for everybody. That is more logical. Then you're saying, ten times he came, didn't work, waiting for 11th. That is not logical. That cannot be God. Because God cannot fail. If He's really God, He'll be successful on His mission one time to save the world. Right? So that's the difference. Why Christ is so unique. Now, of course, we have to communi communicate this nicely, you know, lovingly. Don't, you know, put people down. But we have to make them think, right? So if you're saying you have so many times God came, why did he have to come so many times? That means previous times God failed. But here Bible is saying he came once, he did the work, and now he's offering a free gift to everybody who believes in him, the free gift of salvation. Number five uh, is, if you look at his life, work, teaching and impact on history, now we read about his life, his, his work, his teaching in the Gospels. And many people, even non-Christian, somebody who doesn't have no Christian background. You read his life. They read the Gospels. They are so touched by his life, his teachings. And then you think about his impact on history. Why? Because actually, actually, his life was very ordinary life. He was born in a very small village town called Bethlehem. He did not go from Bangalore to Mangalore. That far he didn't. He traveled. Um, that may be the maximum he traveled, 300, 3 some kilometers, roughly. That means he only went, his whole life, he only went, say, from Bangalore to Mangalore or Bangalore to Chennai. Finished. That's all he went, how far he traveled. He didn't travel more than that. In those days, they have to walk or go on horse or donkey or something like that. That's all he did. He didn't write a book. Um, he didn't form, he didn't build a building. He didn't form a religion. He had 12 people. 12 Disciples. Of course, crowds came and went. But only close disciples, only 12. One of them betrayed him. So, minus one. <laughs> 11. So, we would think, when he died, when the 11 died, everything will be over. And he had very short life. Ministry. Only three and a half years, not even ten. He only preached 
for three and a half years. Not even one full lifetime. Not even just three and a half years he ministered. Only eleven people, eleven faithful people. There have been others who had uh, much bigger uh, followers. They did much more. Everything is forgotten and gone. But this Jesus was born in a small village with 11 faithful followers, three and a half years. Whole world. Whole world. Today. Is impacted. Nobody else with this kind of a background has had such impact. But there have been many good people, many good, yeah, you know, we could say so many names, Fran, saints, and this and that, and you know, who have lived for long. They lived their whole life. They wrote books, they gave many sermons. Full life they lived, they wrote many things. Today we hardly know them, hardly know their names. How come this one person, such a short ministry, has impacted so much the whole world? Say so it has to be God. You know, has to be God that there can be so much impact from such a small beginning. So his his impact, uh, and, and you can see his impact, uh, religious, spiritual, the moral principles, uh, in education, schools, in science, in art, in architect, architect, every aspect, you know. The influence of Jesus Christ is felt. The songs are being written, buildings are being built. Schools are started, hospitals started, all in the in and around the name of Jesus. So many, so many. Uh, uh, you could see his, in, his influence everywhere. And um, if you look at some some of these quotes, you know, this is uh, Napoleon, the French emperor. You know, he says. You know, we speak of Caesar, of Alexander, of the conquest, of the enthusiasm. He says, my, uh, my armies have forgotten me even while I was alive. He says, Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. You know, others have founded empires, but using force. But Jesus, he built his empire on love, and millions are willing to die for him. So unique, so different. He says, you know, there's no one who can approach uh, anything close to who Jesus is. Um, H. G. Wells is a British writer. He was not a believer. And he says, I confess as a historian that this penniless preacher of Nazareth is the very center of history. He's the most dominant figure in all of history. And why would all of human history be centered around his life? And so much influence. You know, we say B.C., A.D. His birth becomes the center point of dividing history. Who is this? Is some some person from Bethlehem? He was living in Nazareth. Three years, three and a half years ministry, and all of history is pinned around his life. It's amazing. You know? So there has to be the hand of God. You know, this is God telling us, a big sign to us. 
big sign staring us in the face. Hey, this is God. <laughs> you know, history is centered around this person, Jesus Christ. Number six, um, the sacrificial death of Christ. So here again, so unique because Jesus spoke about it and the Bible teaches it that Christ's death on the cross was a substitutionary death and it was a saving death and it was a completely satisfying, fully satisfying God's justice. So if you think about it, there are many people who've died by crucifixion. So crucifixion was a common form in those days, during the time of the Romans. Uh, there were many people who had died like that, crucified, nailed on the cross, burnt, you know, tortured, all those things. So it's not just about that, the way physical death. But what the Bible is saying is that while that was happening, spiritually something was happening. His death was substitutionary. He was dying on behalf of other people. His death was saving. That means through his death, salvation is given. And his death was satisfying, complete. It took care of it. So in the spiritual realm, this was what was happening. Physically, yeah, he died like many other people died. Nailed to the cross. Crucified. But spiritually, this was very significant. You don't find anyone else's death described like this. That in his death, actually something deeply spiritual was happening. And the evidence of that is in the lives that are transformed. The evidence of that is in how we can exercise authority over Satan. Right? Because of that death, you can say, devil, leave. So, there was so much purpose in that death of Jesus on the cross. Again, very unique. Nobody else had this kind of death. And number seven, resurrection of Christ. So that is also unique. The Bible claims Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And our whole faith is based on his resurrection. If Jesus didn't die, our faith is useless. So the Christian faith. And we will see in the next chapter you know, about the resurrection of Jesus. But again, this is very unique. Which other faith says the person we believe rose up from the dead? Muhammad died. All the others died, 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 died. Tombs are there. But for Jesus Christ, says he rose up, tomb is empty. And his, his, because, because he lives, our faith is valid. You know. So, and lastly, number eight is, oh no, the two more, sorry, eight and nine. Uh, number eight, why is it unique? The salvation comes through simple faith in Jesus. So again, this is, you know, this is also very unique because the Bible is not saying you believe in Jesus and you, you know, do these ten things. The Bible is saying salvation is given as a free gift through Jesus Christ, through just having faith in Jesus. Have faith in him. You'll have salvation. So this is again very unique. Salvation through faith. And number nine, the last one is that lives are actually transformed in his name. You know, people share all, you know, lots of stories. People set free. People 
lives are just completely changed through faith in Jesus Christ, coming out of all kinds of sin and uh, uh, people are healed, demons are cast out, uh, all in the name of Jesus. And if he wasn't real, if he wasn't alive, uh, then this would not be so. So the que so the thing is, what to you, each person must decide about Jesus. Is he a liar? He just told lies. Huh? I am God. I am the way. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He just lied, 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 lied. Told us lies. Or he was lunatic, meaning something was wrong in his head. So he said all this. Or he was just a legend. He was just some very outstanding man. Or he was Lord. What he truly said. So, we have to decide. Each one must decide. And we can say safely, you know, that only someone who's God, who's Lord, that could have all this impact. Because of a liar, lunatic, legend, all this would have gone, forgotten. Nobody will remember Jesus today. But because he's Lord, Nations all around the world are affected. Right? So, why do we say Jesus is unique? These nine reasons. Right? So, you know, when you're talking to people, you can point to one or more of these reasons and uh, explain. And when people understand that, you know, they can recognize that Jesus is unique. All right, so let's stop here. Any questions on this? Let's. Pastor, uh, yes, go when ahead. we talk about the incarnation and virgin birth yes. of Christ, we know the Holy Spirit came over thing. But when we look at uh, Matthew's genealogy, okay, yeah. and uh, from verse 1 till verse 15, it says uh, Abraham was the father, Isaac was the father, so on and so forth. And for obvious reasons, uh, when it comes to verse 16, it says uh, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Okay, so my question is like when um, we know Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus, Jesus why yes. kind of have that type of a genealogy? What is that uh, type of a connect? Yeah, so so the question, yeah, so the question is why is this whole genealogy traced? Now the genealogy is traced, and it's important to show that this Jesus came from the line of David. Because God had spoken in the Old Testament that the Messiah would come through the line of David. You know, Isaiah 11, you know, there will come a rod out of the stem of Jesse, you know, a shoot will come forth. And he is the one, the Messiah. And he is the one who is going to rule and reign. So Matthew makes it very clear. So this genealogy recorded Matthew and Luke is to Clarify for us, this Jesus has come from the line of David. We can trace it all the way back. And this, therefore, he is, he meets this check. He, he meets this criteria of being the Messiah and the one who is going to rule and reign. Check. So that's important from that perspective. But not from... Um, human standpoint of uh, you know being a descendant of adam for all the other prophecies to be fulfilled yeah yeah any other questions on the uniqueness of jesus christ so this is something we must be fully convinced about very clear about and because in the church today, when I say church means generally, uh, there is a lot of compromise on this area. People are afraid to say Jesus is the only way to salvation. Because when we say that, then people think, ah, oh, you're so narrow-minded, uh, you are so intolerant. Huh? 
They accuse us of all that. Hey, but this is what the Bible says. Either you believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. You can't say, I believe the Bible and I'm saying Jesus is not the unique. Uh, not unique or not the only way. No, you that is you can't. That means you don't believe the Bible, right? So if we believe the Bible, it must be very clear. Jesus Christ is unique. He's the only way to salvation, and we speak the truth in love, and we can explain why we are saying he is the only way to salvation. We'll explain because there's nobody else like this. You show me one other human being with this. Call it with this same, you know, these nine things we will we can consider. You can never find another human being with these nine things. Okay. Any questions from online students? Hello, brother. Good morning. Go ahead, please. How can we answer the questions from some people? They ask how God can have a son, and uh, God can have a son, and that He sent His only Son to the earth when they don't believe in Trinity. Yeah. So that is true. Um, when um, we use the term "Son of God" or "God sent His Son," for many people, it's a it's a stumbling block, and especially for those who come from a Muslim background. So, but this is what the Bible teaches. So, when we say um, Jesus is the Son of God, we have to make it clear that Son of God is a title, right? It doesn't make him second to God, or it doesn't make him lower than God. Jesus is co-equal with the Father, but as a human being, he walked on the earth as a son to the Father. So that's why the title Son of God. So we have to explain. It's a title that is given. And whether they like it or not, the Bible presents a triune God. The Bible talks about God in three persons. God the Father, God the Eternal Word, and God the Holy Spirit. They can say, I don't believe in Trinity, that's that's okay, but this is what we believe, and this is what the Bible says. The Bible talks about one God in three persons, and God the Eternal Word became incarnate and walked on the earth, and his title is the Son of God. This is what we can say. So uh, we can explain it to them. Uh, if they don't want to accept it, it's fine. It's We don't have to force them to accept it. But this is what the Bible teaches us. Now, usually when sharing the gospel, we don't actually want to get into arguments about or debates about Trinity and uh, all of that. So because... You know, sometimes even Christians don't understand how to explain the Trinity, and so it's very difficult. So it's better to avoid it and instead focus on the person of Jesus. And what the Bible teaches us is when the heart turns to the Lord, after that the mind understands. This is Second Corinthians 3, I think it's verse uh, 16 or 17. Let me give you the exact verse. Um, so when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now oh, that is there, the, the lack of understanding is taken away. So Second Corinthians 3:16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So that means when somebody, when the heart comes to the Lord, when they turn to God, then their eyes are open to understand these things. So why do you, you know? Did I, uh, did I understand everything about the Trinity when I believed in Jesus? No. I just believed in Jesus. Later on, you know, I, the, my, the veil was taken. That means my understanding came. Right? So that's what we should do. We should lead people to the Lord. Their heart turns to the Lord. They turn to the Lord. Then the veil is taken away. This lack of understanding is removed. God helps them understand. So our approach should be just focus on Jesus. 
what he did and lead people to faith in Christ. And uh, if at all possible, try to avoid discussion about Trinity. And, you know, so um, uh, we just say God came as a man. Uh, and, you know, especially if we're talking to a Muslim, we will learn a little in one of the upcoming lessons. We try to avoid the term son of God and so on, because that's for them is a stumbling block. And we know it's a stumbling block. So just say God came into this world, you know, which is true. Uh, and then once the heart turns to the Lord, the understanding comes about other things. Yeah. Brother, thank you, brother. Thank you. Okay, so let's pause for here for today. Uh, we'll pick up these things uh, next week and take it forward. All right. Uh, let's close. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the learning today, and we ask for your wisdom uh, to continue to impart and speak truth to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.